Okay. Well, welcome everyone to Psychology 210. Please take a seat. This is Psychology 210, Introduction to Social Psychology. I hope everyone is in the right room. Are you? Okay, good. Let me get started. For today, this afternoon, since this is our first day, I want to talk to you about this course. I'm going to give you some information about what we will study and how we will study it. So I want to talk briefly about the field of social psychology and then I will give you more information about the course requirements. Everybody okay with this? Okay. First of all, uh, in this course, uh, we are going to look at people in social situations. So what does that mean? That means how people interact with other people. That's the simplest way to explain this course. And we're going to discuss some of the theory and the research that explains all of this. Okay. But before I go any further, let me make one point very clear. The main objective of this course is to help you to become more interested in the field of social psychology and to prepare you for more studies in this field. That is my hope. Okay? So I think by now, everyone has had a chance to have a look at the syllabus. Yeah? You saw it on my website, right? So I think that you get the picture that, that I'm going to expect a lot from you in this social psychology class. So I will go over the syllabus now, OK? First, let's talk about the readings. I'll assign new readings each class period, and the reading assignments are going to come from the textbook. You should complete the assigned readings by the date I give you. That's simple. You get the assignments, and then you do the reading. Now, the lectures. I'm going to give a lecture in each of my class, and during my lectures, I'm going to expand on the ideas that you read about in your textbooks. So, for example, I might explain something that you read about in the assignment, or I might give you another example that wasn't in the reading. Now, I want to point out, and this is pretty important, that my lectures will also include information that you won't see in the readings. That's right. My lectures will sometimes have new information. So guess what? You have to come to class. <laughs> uh-huh. All right. The discussions. The discussions, class discussions, our discussions, are an important aspect of this course. During our discussions, I will welcome your questions and comments anytime you want to say something. Any time. You should feel free to contribute your own ideas and your own opinions. But, but for, for this to work, you have to be willing to let the other students do the same. Meaning that we, we all listen to each other. All of us. That's the deal in here. Oh, <laughs> and by the way, I just want to say, you don't have to agree with me. But whenever you do express your opinion, you do have to show me that you understand the ideas we're talking about in class. So what I'm saying is these discussions should show how you think about ideas in the readings and the ideas you hear in the lectures and discussions, and also what you think about them. You get the picture? Now, what about your grade? I know you want to know this information. All right. Your grade consists mostly of quizzes and exams. For quizzes, you'll be able to use your lecture notes. So attending class and taking good notes is going to be the key to your success in this class. For exams, you will not be able to use your notes. So, no notes for exams.
I'll explain about the class presentation and the two opinion and the two excuse me two opinion papers later in the semester. We don't need to get into that right now. All right. You saw on the syllabus that attendance is also going to be a, a big component in this class. But let me talk about that right now. Attendance means you have to attend class regularly. But not just come to class, you have to participate in class discussions. So what I'm saying is your participation, whatever it is, is going to affect your grade. OK? So far, so good? Now, I know this seems like a lot, but it's really pretty simple. My expectations are that you come to class, turn your work in when it's due, share your ideas, listen to others, and, and do the readings. And you will do fine in this class, no problem. OK? All right. That's enough for our first day. I will see you next time, and we will discuss chapter one in your textbooks. So there's your first reading assignment, chapter one. OK? Bye now. Hello, everyone. Good to see you all. You ready to begin? Great. Great. In this class, we've been looking at the behavior of people and especially looking at how their behavior is affected by the place they live in. I'd like to continue this in today's lecture. Today I'd like to talk about a study that was done to measure the pace of life. The study compares different cities around the world and asks the question, how and why do different places in the world have different paces of life? As you probably know, Pace tends to be part of how we describe the atmosphere of the place. If you've traveled a bit or read about life in different places, you know that the pace of life differs in different cultures and places, right? But why are some places faster than others? What exactly are the factors that make up the differences in pace of life? Before we discuss this question, I want to make sure that we all have the same idea about the meaning of pace of life. By pace of life, I mean the speed at which life is lived or business is carried out. OK? Let me get that up for you. So what specific characteristics of places and cultures make them slow or fast? One social psychologist, a fellow named um, Robert Levine, a professor at California State University in Fresno, California, uh, created a study that allowed researchers to analyze some data, some numbers that could accurately define the pace of life of a place. He wanted to know the answer to this question. What makes a place have a slow or fast pace? Here's how he and his researchers went about it. They analyzed and compared 31 different cities around the world. They looked at three different factors. Let me put them up here so you can follow, All right? What is the average walking speed of the place? Now, to measure that, he randomly selected people, both men and women, and watched the speed at which they walked in crowded downtown areas. Um, he watched them as they walked a distance of 60 feet, or about 20 meters. Second. He looked at speed in the workplace. Now, he did this in an interesting way. He went to post offices all around the world. Yes, that's right, post offices. And he measured how long it took a postal clerk to sell someone a stamp. They measured the time that passed between when a clerk received money and the customer received the stamp. They looked at how much time that took. 
Okay? Are you with me so far? Yeah? Okay. Now, the third thing he looked at was how interested a place was in keeping accurate time on clocks. So, the researchers went to 15 randomly chosen banks and looked at their clocks. Then, they compared the time on these clocks to the time reported by the phone company. You know what I mean. When you call the phone company to learn the time of day from a recorded voice, that time is considered to be very accurate. So, the researchers looked at these factors during the workday in 31 different cities around the world to get a specific idea of pace. By looking at these factors, the researchers came up with a rating of overall pace of life, the overall sense of time urgency. Let's look at a few highlights from this survey. Uh, the survey, by the way, was conducted in the late 1990s, so there may be some changes from what we would find in the same countries today. Okay, in the fastest category, Switzerland is in first place with high ranking in all three areas. Their clock accuracy ranked first. Then comes Ireland and Germany, and Japan came in fourth. Really, these top four countries were all very similar. Let's look now at places where life is slow. The slowest countries were all non-industrialized countries, meaning there is not much industry, not many factories producing products. You can see here that they are from the Middle East, Syria, Asia, Indonesia, and Latin America, El Salvador, Brazil, and finally Mexico. So what are the common factors in the countries at the top? and those at the bottom of the list. For these experiments and other studies, the researchers found five main factors that affect the pace of life in cultures around the world. Let's look at those. People tend to move faster in places with vital economies, lots of money changing hands, um, a high degree of industrialization, lots of companies, Larger populations, many, many people. Cooler climates, not the hot ones. And cultures that value individualism versus valuing the group. Interesting, don't you think? Unfortunately, we can't get into this discussion now. We'll talk about these details in the next class, all right? All right, I think everyone is here, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, let's go back to our discussion of business innovation. And yesterday I was explaining that in business there are many types of innovation. Uh, so we said, remember, there's product innovation, there's innovation in business organization, of course there's marketing innovation, and there are other types of innovation, okay? Well, today I want to talk about product innovation. So that means how businesses come up with ideas for new products. First, we'll talk about innovation in the 21st century in general. Then I'll tell you about some qualities that successful innovators share and give you two good examples. Okay? Now, in the past, businesses got a lot of their new ideas because something they did was a surprise or a mistake. So innovation was something they didn't plan. It was just luck. We all know that times have changed in the 21st century. It's not enough for companies to depend on luck to develop new products and compete successfully in global markets. In fact, the research shows us that the best companies make innovation a large part of their business. That means they spend a lot of their money on innovation. And that is exactly the opposite of waiting for luck to happen, right? Okay, let's step it up now. I want to point out one thing that these innovative companies have in common. 
one thing that they all have, and that is courage. Courage. What I'm saying is these companies aren't afraid to take risks. These companies are constantly trying new ideas. And even though they know, they know that many of their ideas are going to fail, the business experts say that these companies make their own luck. They make their own luck. They are risk takers, to put it simply. So let's take a look at a couple of successful innovative companies, meaning companies that are creating new products and are doing well. OK. A great example of this, uh, a great example for us to talk about is Apple computers. Yeah. Apple. OK, Apple is a computer company in California. A few years ago, they came up with the idea to make a totally new product, a digital music player that was small and easy to use, the iPod, right? You know it. OK, now Steve Jobs, he's the CEO of Apple. Steve Jobs realized it wasn't enough to create a fun little machine for music people still needed a reason to buy it. So he asked his company to think outside the box. He wanted his people to come up with a way for customers to use this little machine to get music out of their computers and the internet. And then they could listen to the music on their iPod everywhere they went, at home, school, at the gym, and so on. At the time, Everybody said this was impossible, impossible, because nobody had ever done this before. Well, Apple got to work and solved all the technical and legal problems, and today, well, today the iPod earns over $1 billion a year for Apple. So again, it's that courage to take a risk and try something completely new. Now. Uh, let's move on because there's a second important characteristic of today's innovative companies. And that is that they think about their product in a new way. Okay? And when they do this kind of thinking, they also invent a new market. And of course, that means, you got it, higher profits. Are you with me so far? Good? OK. A great example of this is Starbucks. Starbucks. You guys know Starbucks, right? The coffee chain. 10,000 stores around the world. I just went to a Starbucks in Taiwan, as a matter of fact. OK, a few years ago, Starbucks was looking for a way to get new customers. And they wanted, to, they wanted a way to make customers stay in the store longer. And what else? Spend more money. That's when they started thinking outside of the box. They realized that their stores could be more than a place where people buy a cup of coffee. They thought about what people do in their free time. And they realized that people spend a lot of time on the internet. Everybody knows that. So Starbucks thought people might like to do it outside of their house, where they could maybe meet new people. So they started to provide wireless internet service, the internet in their coffee shops, right? They even have some Starbucks where you can download music to your computer. Now, I've got to point out that Starbucks 
can't say for sure that their profits went up after this change. But they did find, they did find out that customers who use the internet at Starbucks stay in the store nine times longer than customers who just drink coffee there. So probably, probably, they spend more money at Starbucks too. Well, it's an example of how a totally new idea can change a business. In this case, they thought of a product in a new, and some people say, a strange way. A way no one had ever thought about. Well, I see we've run out of time, so let's pick up tomorrow. All right, folks, let's go ahead and get the ball rolling here. It's Friday, and I'm sure everybody wants to start the weekend, right? I'm sure I'm right about that one. Okay, we've been discussing some of the factors related to successful international business. Today, I'd like to talk about a topic that I think you already know something about. Believe it or not, it's MTV. That's right, MTV, maybe your favorite TV channel. MTV. So, MTV, the giant music TV network. MTV is a great case study because it shows us, I mean, gives us a good idea of how one company can do business all around the world with incredible success. So what I want to do is discuss the reasons for the gigantic success of MTV. Are we good to go? Okay. So first of all, let's look at some of the, uh, some of the statistics for MTV before we go on to analyze their business plan. Okay? Okay. First of all, MTV has been around for 25 years or so. It reaches more than one billion people around the world. You heard me right. More than one billion people watch MTV. Most of these viewers are young people between the ages of 10 and 34 who watch the music videos and other programs that are created for a young audience. So in other words, MTV is already the most popular television network in the world. In the world. Pretty amazing stuff. So now, I'm, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that I'm hoping that you're wondering what their business plan is for the near future. What more could MTV want? Huh? Well, their business plan is to expand their network, are you ready, until MTV exists everywhere in the world. Until every person in the world has the ability to watch MTV. It's already in lots of countries, but not in all. They want to be in all. So let's do some statistics. Let's talk about profits. Here we go. In 2005, MTV brought in $5.2 billion. That's $5.2 billion from all around the world. Let me break that down for you, OK? MTV is an American company, right? In the United States, MTV reaches about, about 88 million homes. But outside the United States, MTV is in more than 331 million homes. And that's in 164 countries. And you can watch it in 18 different languages. OK, here's another way to say it. MTV is number 48 on the list of the top 100 brands in the world. Got the picture? They're big. Big in the whole world. Very successful, right? So you might be wondering, what makes MTV so successful? I hope you're wondering. All right, so let's analyze the factors that have led to MTV's success. OK, probably the main reason for MTV's success around the world is also maybe the most interesting one. You might expect to find MTV plays the same music videos and the same shows all over the world, but they don't. Nope. They play the music that is popular in each country. And not just each continent. 
So not African rock music or European rock music, but they play the rock music of Italy in Italy and the rock music of Kenya in Kenya. So what I'm saying is they play the local popular music. They show videos of local people playing local music. And along the same lines, they produce programs that focus on the people of the culture of the country that they're in. So what I'm saying is MTV in India looks like India. In Japan, Japanese MTV looks like Japan. MTV may be huge, international company, but it looks local. All right, so now we have to ask, how, do the, how does MTV do this? How do they find the local talent? Well, the answer is they hire staff in each country. That means people who speak the country's language and know about the local musical performers. And they create local programs that show these performers. In fact, I learned that the rule at MTV is that 70% of the programs must show local performers. So local, 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 that's the story. So we can see that MTV really created a smart business plan. And what's the result? MTV's global market is growing 20% each year. 20% each year. I just read that they want to increase this to 40%. They have a plan, and for now, it's working. They're at the top of their game. All right, next time, we'll look again at MTV's success and see how we could apply these ideas, all the stuff we said today about this one company, to other kinds of international businesses. OK? Bye-bye. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all here this morning. Yesterday, we talked about news coverage and its effects on people. Today, well, this morning, I want to talk about another kind of coverage, and that's the coverage of celebrities in the mass media. Celebrities, movie stars, rock stars, and people like that in the media. The reason for this topic is, and I'm pretty sure you all know this, the amount of celebrity coverage has been increasing tremendously. OK, everybody knows this has been happening. And it's not just celebrity news sources. Today, it's not unusual to see news about movie stars or television stars on the front pages of regular newspapers. Yeah, newspapers. I'd like to show you some research that actually shows how much new celebrity news coverage there is. So uh, take a look at this graph. It's got some pretty significant results. OK, so here you see the researchers analyzed American news magazines. So that means they looked at serious magazines that have articles about government, the economy, crime, things like that. The tall columns show the percentages of real news, government, the economy, and so on. And the short red column shows the percentage of articles about celebrities. You can see that in the last 25 years or so, real news coverage has gone down about 10%. And that celebrity news has doubled, meaning there's twice as much celebrity news now as there was in 1980. That's big news. <laughs> Experts who study the media say that there is so much coverage of entertainment news like when a rock star gets married or divorced, or when an actress has a baby. So much of this in the newspaper and magazines and on television that there is less and less time and space for real news, like news about events in the world. Now, we have to ask ourselves, why did this change happen? Why is there so much interest in celebrities today? Well, let's uh, move on now to discuss that. Let's look at one of the major reasons of the increase in media coverage of celebrities. 
In a nutshell, celebrities sell. Back in the 1980s, newspapers were starting to lose money. More people were getting the news somewhere else, not from newspapers. So newspapers began to print more news about celebrities and fewer articles with real news. Why? Because celebrity news sells. It's all about increasing their profits. There's no way around the fact. People buy celebrity news. People buy newspapers to read about movie stars and other celebrities. That's it. OK, so that's one reason for more celebrity coverage. Next, uh, let's talk about another reason. This reason is also something we all know. It's the increase in the number of internet sites and television channels. Most places you can watch television news 24 hours a day, right? So the number of new sources of news is another cause here. Let me explain. <clears throat> All of these new sources of news, the websites and cable news channels going 24 hours a day, they need to attract viewers and fill up broadcast time and internet space. They need content. And this content has to be popular with many people. So more and more they feature entertainment news, especially Hollywood gossip. All right, that's enough about the change in the media. Let's go on to what this all, uh, what this all means to us, students of the media. Well, research about children and the media shows that kids today know much more about the lives of rock singers and movie stars than kids of the past and they know much less about world and local events, like what the president does or about a new law that affects them, for example. Other research has pointed to another negative result of all the celebrity coverage. At the London School of Economics and Science, researchers found that the human brain isn't really made, it's not meant to take all this constant news about celebrities. Weddings, deaths, parties, all those bits of celebrity news. The proof of this, they tell us, is that children who watch a lot of celebrity news, they, they discovered, are losing touch with their friends and families. That means they're, they're spending less time with the important people in their lives and spending more time with famous movie stars or rock stars. And even though, of course, they don't really know these celebrities, right? Now, uh, to wrap up, I'm going to uh, leave you with some predictions for the future. Most media experts will tell you that the amount of celebrity coverage is not going to stop. It's going to continue to increase. And they also say that news coverage, regular news coverage, is going to continue to decrease. We'll discuss the possible effects of this in our group discussion tomorrow. So do a little thinking about it and be prepared to share your ideas. That's it for today, and I'll see you all tomorrow. OK, I'm ready to begin, so let's get started. So we're going to continue our discussion of mass communications today. Now, I want you to remember that when you say mass communications, we mean communication from one person or group of people through a medium, which is some communication device, to many different people at once. So there are many people who are the receivers of the information. All right, so let me just get that on the board. So information through a medium. OK, 
okay, to many. Now today, we'll look at how mass communication has changed over the centuries, okay? We'll be looking at three major changes, revolutions really, in the history of mass communication. Now, the first communication revolution was the development of phonetic writing. So, first was the development of phonetic writing. All right, now this occurred 3,000 years ago. So it's 3,000 years ago. All right, now the development of phonetic writing meant that writing moved away from using pictographs, okay? Now these are symbols that represent objects and ideas and move toward using symbols to represent the actual sound of the spoken word. Now let me give you an example. Now in pictographic writing, people actually drew some kind of picture of an idea. So for example, to communicate the idea of a dog, they actually drew a dog. But in phonetic writing, people represented the sound, d -o -g, with three letters, d-o-g. Now, this was revolutionary. Why? Because it made writing easier. It was smaller, so it was actually easier to produce. So we see a real change in writing style. Now, not only did the style of writing change, but the medium on which the writing appeared changed also. Pictographic writing was done on heavy clay tablets, tablets that were so heavy that they really weren't portable. But around the same time that phonetic writing developed, a new medium was invented, papyrus. Now, papyrus was a type of paper made from a grass plant. Now, you can imagine that this paper was much lighter than clay. So this combination of a lightweight medium, papyrus, and phonetic writing made information more portable so it could reach a bigger audience. Now, it also made it easier and cheaper to store the information. So, information became more portable and storable. So this meant that for the first time, people had access to written material. So more people became literate, all right? That is, they learned to read and write, which led to wider communication. So people in different societies could convey information to people in other parts of the world. So you see, this was really the beginning of mass communication. One group or one person could now communicate with many people. So as societies grew more literate, this resulted in a demand for materials for people to read. So do you get the picture? All right, because at this point, we're ready to look at the next change. The bigger population of readers created the second communications revolution, and that's printing. So the second is printing. And it also includes the printing press. Now, a printing press meant that information could be reproduced quickly. Now, in the year 305, so 1,700 years ago, the first wooden printing presses were invented in China. The printing press became more widely used when Johannes Gutenberg invented a printing press in Germany in the year 1455, and that used metal and movable type. Now, this was a very significant invention. The metal printing press made it faster and easier to print books and materials. And faster meant that more information was available to many more people. Now let me explain why this is considered a revolution. Before the printing press, knowledge and information were in the hands of only a few privileged people, okay? A scholar who wanted to know some specific thing or, or get some specific information had to travel to the place where the information was kept. But once information could be copied easily, 
with the printing press, the information itself could travel to people beyond the society that created it. Okay? And with the printing press, information was more accessible. So it was accessible to everyone. So you really see how big this revolution was. Okay, now it's not a surprise that libraries developed as well because it was easier to store information on paper. Information was now both portable and easy to store. Okay? Now this brings me to the third communications revolution. And that is computers. All right? Now we we are all part of this revolution which began in the 1950s, the computer revolution. Now computers have become the electronic storehouses and transmitters of large amounts of information, information that previously only existed in physical form. Okay? It was carved in stone or, or written on paper. Computer technology makes everything quicker and easier. Computers process, transmit, and store information much more efficiently than any previous system. Computers have changed the nature of mass communication. So to wrap up, you can see from these changes that there are three ideas that are key to mass communication. And let me just state them clearly. First, the ability to store information. Second, the ability to transport information. And finally, having access to information. These are essential to mass communication. OK? See you on Tuesday. In today's class, I'd like to continue our discussion of sleep. Today, we'll discuss the reasons why we sleep. In other words, we'll answer the question, why do people sleep? And you might find some of this especially interesting because I'll be discussing some of the interesting evidence on how sleep affects learning. We all know how it feels when we need sleep. We feel drowsy. We have trouble concentrating. You know, but why do our bodies need sleep? It's a good question. Let's look a bit at some of the reasons. Uh, scientists uh, continue to do studies to learn more about exactly why humans need sleep. Interestingly enough, they aren't 100% sure. They don't know, for example, why human beings cannot simply rest, meaning lay down quietly, as insects do. But they do know some of the reasons why we sleep. We'll look at two of the reasons, OK? One reason is that it helps our bodies recover. Sleep helps the body recover from all the work it did while, it, while the person was awake. This makes sense, right? Because we all know how bad we feel when we suffer from sleep deprivation. Okay. Uh, studies show that there is another interesting reason why we sleep. These studies show that sleep is important for learning. It aids or helps learning. Well, let's look at how this works. As a person sleeps, the brain continues to work. It performs tasks. Tasks like organizing long-term memory and integrating new information learned during the day. And physical tasks like repairing 
and renewing the nerve cells in the brain. This is really important for US students. You'll be interested to know, in some experiments, a person trying to learn something doesn't actually learn it and improve the knowledge until after they have had more than six hours of sleep. And listen to this. <laughs> it's surprising. Um, a study done at Trent University in Ontario, Canada suggested that students who studied hard all week and then stayed up all night partying on the weekend lost as much as 30% of what they had learned during the week. Why do you think this is true? It seems the brain needs time, uh, time to file away some new information and skills in the proper places in the brain so that they can be found and used later. So, we know this about uh, learning, but scientists want to know more. And, uh, and one, one, one way scientists learn about the reasons we need to sleep is they look at what happens to people when they don't sleep enough, when they are deprived of sleep. Now, there are many um, studies done to learn about the effects of sleep deprivation. And these studies all show the same thing. Over time, sleep deprivation can have serious side effects. There are three areas that are most affected. There is impairment of our thinking ability, an impairment of our physical abilities, and also our moods, our psychological condition is affected. Now let's look at some examples at, of how the thinking ability of the brain is affected by lack of sleep. Okay. Now this diagram of the brain, I'd like to look at just one part of the, the brain, the uh, frontal lobe, the part of the brain that is at the forehead. Okay. You see it? Now, right there at the front of the brain. So, what does the frontal lobe do? Well, it helps the body with speech and with creative thinking. There, there have been some interesting studies uh, that show that there is less activity in the frontal lobe when people are sleep deprived. So, this means that people who are sleep, uh, people who are sleep deprived have difficulty with functions performed in the frontal lobe. So, for example, when speech is affected, people are less able to speak clearly. And this means that their speech is slurred. They stutter or speak in a flat, monotone voice. They also speak at a slower than usual pace. Now, uh, another example is sleep-deprived people don't have the speed or creative abilities to cope with making quick and logical decisions. And once they have made the decisions, they don't uh, act on them very uh, successfully. Studies have also shown that a lack of sleep impairs people's ability to focus on several different but related tasks at one time. This means, for, for instance, that that tasks are done, but more slowly and less efficiently. A good example of this is that a person can uh, react to a complex problem, but similar to verbal tests, they will probably pick an unoriginal or easy solution. So you can see how important sleep is to the brain and to your performance in class and on tests or speaking clearly and having creative answers are both very important skills. So for those of you who usually burn the candle at both ends, I want you to go home tonight and get a good night's sleep after you cram for tomorrow's quiz, of course. I'll see you tomorrow.
Hello everyone, ready to begin? Today we're going to talk about an aspect of geography called cultural geography. I'd like to discuss the ways that the geographical features of the earth affect the spread of cultures. But first, what is cultural geography? It's the study of the way that the physical environment of the earth interacts with the people and cultures of the earth. Let me explain more so it's clear. Cultural geography studies the location of cultures. A cultural geographer sees differences in cultures and wants to know what effect the geography of the culture had in the spread, or lack of spread, of cultural elements like beliefs and customs. Now, this should give you a pretty good picture of the focus and interest of cultural geography. So let's turn now and look more carefully at this idea of culture and how cultures are affected by the geography of the earth. Some experts say that there are right now 15,000 different cultures in the world. Now by culture, I mean groups of people who share similar ways of going about life. They have a common set of learned beliefs, values, and behaviors. Culture regions differ greatly in size. Some are very large, like the Islamic culture region that makes up millions of square miles of North Africa, the Middle East, and Southwest Asia. Some are very small, like Spanish Harlem, which encompasses about two square miles of Manhattan in New York City. So a cultural geographer wants to know why. Why are there so many cultures on Earth today? If we all started out more or less the same way, how did we end up with 15,000 different cultures? So let's look at this idea, at how geographical features affect the spread of culture. Today, I'll discuss barrier effects. This is a term used to describe things that stop cultures from spreading. Physical barriers or natural elements that prevent cultures from spreading. These physical barriers isolate people. They isolate them by somehow preventing or limiting cultures from changing. Isolation is one general reason why we have so many cultures. Let's look at how this works. When people can easily communicate, they exchange information and ideas. The more they share, the more similar, the more alike they tend to become because ideas, beliefs, and values go back and forth between the cultures. Geographic isolation makes communication difficult, and this causes differences between cultures. We'll discuss five classic examples of physical barriers. The first is oceans. Oceans were barriers for centuries. People living on islands surrounded by ocean were usually prevented from or unable to exchange things with other cultures. So until shipbuilding and navigation, oceans were a powerful barrier. This is even true today. Some islands in the Pacific Ocean are home to people who have little contact with the outside world. Let's move on. Forests are another example. In the past, forests were much larger than today. In fact, nearly all of what is now the Western United States, for example, was continuous forest. And this was the same in large parts of Africa, Asia, Central and South America. How did this affect culture? Well, once a group of people settled in the forest, they became separate from other groups. Can you imagine this? The forest was so dense that they couldn't easily go through it. Forest societies were isolated because it was so difficult to travel. Okay, 
Our third example of a physical barrier is mountains. In areas that are extremely mountainous, we see that communication between cultures is also inhibited. Let me give you an example of this. The island of New Guinea. You heard of it. It's an island near Indonesia and Australia in the South Pacific Ocean. Now, on this small island, the total population is 7 million, there are an estimated 700 languages spoken. What an amazing fact. It makes no sense that so many languages exist in such a small space until you look at the geography. Let me explain. New Guinea is extremely mountainous and has many deep valleys. It also has dense tropical forests in the lowlands. These extreme geographical features resulted in hundreds of relatively isolated areas of people. And these groups have developed their own languages. OK. Now, the last two types of barriers are deserts and tundra. You can easily see why deserts have also tended to isolate people and inhibit the spread of culture. I won't go into that one. But tundra, tundra you might not be familiar with. Tundra refers to areas like you find in northernmost North America and Europe. It's an area at the very high latitude at the top of the Earth. The environment is very cold, sub-freezing, and treeless. Native peoples adapted to this harsh environment, but the harshness of the climate made it difficult to access. So tundra also is a physical barrier. OK, those are the five barrier effects. The bottom line is physical barriers have isolated peoples and culture. It's hard to imagine today because of amazing advances in travel and communication, but these barriers were a significant influence in the development of the cultures of the world. Okay, see you next time. It's good to see you all. Looks like you're ready to go. <laughs> okay, good. I'd like to get started on today's topic. Today, we will be discussing fairy tales. Let me start off with a definition so we have a clear idea of what we mean by fairy tales. Fairy tales are stories that have magical people and creatures in them. Things happen in fairy tales that can't happen in ordinary life. Let me give you a few examples. A boy becomes a bird. A princess sleeps for a hundred years. Mirrors talk. Pumpkins become carriages. A lamp is home to a genie. The word we use to describe the events that happen in fairy tales is magical. OK. Let's dive in and focus today on the purpose of fairy tales and answer this question. Why were fairy tales created? Let's start by looking at the audience. Who were fairy tales written for? Some people assume that fairy tales were created for children, but <laughs> this, in fact, is absolutely not the case. From the very beginning, thousands of years ago, Fairy tales were stories that adults told other adults. But why did they start telling fairy tales? What was the purpose of fairy tales? <clears throat> we will look at three general different ideas about the purposes that fairy tales serve. These purposes are important to discuss because they help us understand why fairy tales were meant for adults, for the adult imagination. The first idea is that fairy tales cause a sense of wonder in the reader or listener. Let me explain. 
Wonder is the emotion that we feel when we are excited by the idea that something new and unexpected or unexplainable has happened. It is this sense of wonder, this sense of strange and magical things happening that some scholars believe is the reason that fairy tales exist. They help people wonder about the workings of the universe, this universe where anything can happen at any time. In fact, all kinds of strange things happen in fairy tales. Let me explain how this works. If we can imagine that anything can happen to the characters in fairy tales, then we might also believe that things can happen in our own lives, that life can change, that problems can go away, people can find answers. So you see, fairy tales help make us hopeful. They make us believe that life really can get better. Isn't this a wonderful explanation? Okay. Let's move on and look at another possible purpose of fairy tales, and that is entertainment. <clears throat> Just entertainment. People didn't have TVs or radios or even theater in most places, so what did they do? They played music, they talked, they told each other stories. Scholars support this idea by pointing out that fairy tales became very popular in Europe and America during the late 1800s. Oh, and by the way, I will include some dates on the quiz, so you should probably include them in your notes. Where was I? Oh, <laughs> the late 1800s. Okay, at that point in history, daily life and work was extremely routine and boring. Take, for example, factory work or being a worker on a farm. This kind of work can be very hard on the body and mind and leave little time for daydreaming and leisure and uh, imagination. So fairy tales help people escape from the routine in their lives. Okay? Now I want to discuss one more idea about the purpose of fairy tales. Some say that fairy tales serve the purpose of civilizing people. Now, what do I mean by civilizing? Civilizing really means educating people about good behavior. Let's look at how this works. Think of the plots in fairy tales, the events in each story. These events teach us things. They teach readers important values of life and society. Values like hard work, honesty, goodness. This is a really good way to teach people how to be good citizens. There are always clear consequences in these fairy tales. For example, people get punished for not obeying their parents, so we learn to obey our parents. Most fairy tales show characters getting rewards when they change their behavior and follow the rules of the family or society. So when you take a step back, you really see that these stories, these stories that you think of as simple and childlike, are really not so simple. In fact, they're really very deep. Fairy tales are stories about who we are and what we believe in. They may come in the form of entertainment, easy to understand tales of wonder, but they are actually quite powerful. So let me wrap up with this thought. If you doubt the power of fairy tales, think for a minute about how many of these stories you still know. Okay, that's it for today. Bye-bye.
Good afternoon, everyone. Now, before, you, before we get started, uh, remember you'll have a quiz in the next class, okay? Okay, so today, we begin our discussion of modern architecture. And this afternoon, I'll be discussing a very general concept that is important for our understanding of modern architecture. Now, as I discuss this concept, I'm going to give you a little background on modern architecture. Then later, I'll move on to focus on one giant architect of our times, and that's Frank Gehry. OK, first, let me give you a, a tiny little bit of background on modern architecture. OK, now, we all know that a building does more than simply give us shelter. We can all think of some buildings that are just really beautiful or really interesting. So this tells us that sometimes architecture can also be, well, art. Let me explain what I mean. Let's take a look at these famous buildings just to get an idea. Here's a building by the famous architect, Anthony Gaudi. Take a look at this. Everyone loves this building. It's an apartment building, but from our point of view today, it certainly is more than just a shelter for people. It's also very pleasing to the eye. To me and many other people, it's, it's very fun to look at. It's truly a work of art. Isn't it fabulous? Now, here's the tallest building in the world right now. It's a skyscraper in Taiwan called Taipei 101. Most people who see this building love it, not because it's an office building, and not only because it's so tall, it's also incredibly beautiful. Don't you think so? So, I think I've made my point that um, that architecture has a purpose, but it's also something that can be very beautiful at the same time. It can please the eye. This is an important point. All right, this brings me to the key concept for today. In modern architecture, so let's say architecture from 1900 to the present, there's been this big question. What is the relationship between a building's form and its function? This was the question asked by the world-famous American architect named Louis Sullivan. Okay. Now, Sullivan believed quite strongly that form follows function. Okay, but what was Sullivan's point? Hmm? Okay, well, Sullivan wanted to say that the purpose of a building should tell the architect how to design the building. And consequently, people should be able to know what its purpose was just by looking at it. So most architects agreed with Sullivan and followed his idea this for the next several decades. Now, I want to move on to show you how architects have changed their attitude about form and function. This is very interesting. In the last, uh, let's say, 25 years, many architects, many famous architects, have ignored what Sullivan said they've chosen to go against the idea that form follows function. And they've built some fantastic buildings. This leads us to my favorite modern architect. And he's very famous for not believing that form follows function. His name is Frank Gehry.
Let me show you his most famous design. This is the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, in Spain. It's a very well-known museum. It has famous art inside, paintings and statues inside. But do you think this looks like a museum? I don't think so. Take a look at these curves, these round shapes. Geary designed this, some people say. So there are no real corners, no straight lines. So sometimes it looks like a ship. And it's on the water, as you can see. So when people visit the museum, what do they notice? They notice the shiny curves, the reflection of the water. But they might not immediately think, ah, this is a museum. So what I'm trying to show you here is that there's very little connection between the form of the building, all these curves, all the shiny metal, and the purpose of the building to show the art to people. It's an art museum, but it doesn't really look like one. OK, since we have a few more minutes, let's analyze another Frank Geary building. Here it is. This building is very playful, very fun, and it really catches the eye. Huh? OK, but I have a surprise for you. This is actually the Computer Science Research Center at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, the most famous university for science and technology in the world. So it's a very serious place. So again, we see Frank Geary making a kind of game out of the whole form and function idea. He's being ironic meaning he's actually doing the opposite of what he claims to be doing, designing a building for a serious purpose. You could say he's, well, he's really twisted the form and function idea, and he's had a lot of fun along the way. This place is really crazy. I, I love it. OK, I, I think I'd better wrap it up now. Next time, we'll focus on one type of modern building the skyscraper. Okay? See you next week.